Good afternoon. Um, I'm Kira Long. I'll be presenting um, on this topic, type B aortic dissection, the masquerade of malperfusion. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. Um, I think when Dr. Hayes uh, found out that I was from New Orleans, he really wanted to pigeonhole me because this was the title slide that he sent me to get me started. <laughs> So aortic dissection, so I'm gonna be focusing primarily on type B dissections, and uh, but there's a lot of ways that we classify them, and I know a lot of this has been reviewed already, so this will be a little bit of a summary, but we think about anatomy, chronicity, and symptomatology. So I'm gonna be focusing on type B dissections, so that's about a third of the dissections, type A's are actually a majority. Um, the chronicity, um, I think Dr. Hayes will touch on this a little bit more, but there's this traditional paradigm that deals with acute and chronic. So less than two weeks, it's acute, more than two weeks, it's chronic. And a lot of that's based on the early data that showed about 70%, 74% of patients die within the first 14 days if untreated. Um, the updated paradigm is really much more type B specific, so less than two weeks is acute, more than three months is chronic, and then you have this kind of sweet spot of two weeks to three months that's subacute. And so when you start thinking about when you're going to treat these people and why you're treating them, this is, this is really your window that's going to avoid hopefully a retrograde type A, but then also allow you to still mobilize that flap. So the symptomatology, again, this very traditional paradigm of it's either uncomplicated or it's complicated. And so, so what gets you into each category? If you have pain and hypertension and that's it, you're uncomplicated. You're a type B, we're gonna treat you with IV blood pressure control, pain control, and get you home. Complicated, so if you've ruptured, if you have some sort of malperfusion to an end organ, but what about if your hypertension is really difficult to control? What if you're up to three antihypertensive drips and you're developing pulmonary edema? Um, is that actually complicated? Pot potentially. And is that possibly a manifestation of some sort of malperfusion? And, and that's kind of what you have to start thinking about when you have these patients who start lingering around and you didn't think you were gonna treat them, but they're not quite ready to go home. So what is malperfusion from? So essentially it's a branch obstruction to an end organ. You have the true lumen that gets compressed by the false lumen. And there's two types. There's dynamic, which uh, accounts for about 80% of branch obstructions, and then static. And dynamic is exactly what it sounds like. You have a prolapsing septum that goes into the osteum. It varies with the cardiac cycle. Um, and and there's kind of two parts of it. So part of it is your branch is getting intermittently obstructed by this moving dynamic flap, but also you're having decreased perfusion into the true lumen that this branch is coming off of. Static obstruction is a little bit more serious, so the dissection plane actually extends into the osteum. You have stasis, and you actually have an inflammatory process going on when that tear extends, and you end up with thrombosis of a branch lumen. So these are the, the main things that we think about when we look at malperfusion. So stroke or loss of consciousness is gonna be pretty specific to a type A dissection, um, but paralysis, extremity ischemia, mesenteric ischemia, renal failure, all of those things can be either type A or type B. And so in type B, the, these may be a big part of your presenting symptoms. So what do we do, when do we do it, and why? Um, and again, Dr. Hayes is gonna get a lot more into kind of the when should we do it and, and what parts of this tell us that we need to intervene sooner. Um, but I know we just, we just saw this slide, but um, this was like a lot of what treatment paradigms were based on was this early IRAD data that's almost 20 years old now. And so, you know, all comers is a pretty high mortality at 30 days. It was just over 20%. Um, we knew that if you treated type A's medically, they died. And if you treated them surgically, they did all right. And initially we thought that if you 
if you treated type Bs medically, they actually did all right. And if you treated them surgically, they died. And um, I think this is the, the data set that's really changing over this past five years and going forward. So what do we do? So if it's malperfusion, we're pretty sure it's kind of an urgent, emergent, acute, one of these presenting symptoms, or you know, if one of those develops over that, over that first uh, two weeks plus, then it's a subacute. And if it's chronic, if they have a malperfusion, you really have to start thinking about how you're gonna treat that because those flaps get really scarred in, really thickened, and they're very difficult to move with endovascular techniques. So we just went over these a little bit, but your cross-sectional imaging is, of course, going to be your mainstay. But when you start talking about malperfusion, especially in that, you know, not in that initial presenting time, but in that two weeks that you're coming up on, you need to start thinking about other ways to diagnose it because, you know, does the patient have an increasing creatinine because they're malperfusing or because you've gotten three CTAs in a week? Um, so that's something to think about. And so ultrasound is a really great modality um, outside of that immediately acute window. Um, and then IBIS, which is one of my favorite things. So um, <laughs> it's an intravascular ultrasound. It's a really great adjunct. Um, it is endovascular, um, and it has a lot of uses. Um, dissection, I think, is, is one of the most popular. And essentially, it's a catheter with an ultrasound probe at the tip. It's got markers, so you know how far you in and it, far you are in, and, and you hook up to your, um, to your transducer. Um, and these are the kind of images you get. So you can see branches, you can see thrombus within the lumen, you can see how dynamic your flap is, and this is just a little diagram. So there's your catheter going through, and that's the, the image that you're getting. So I'm gonna go through a couple cases of, uh, of malperfusion, of varying uh, acuities and anatomies. Um, so the first, so this was a 66-year-old woman who presented from an outside hospital, or to an outside hospital with back pain. We got the call and she was transferred over. Um, but along with the back pain, she had, and she was very specific about this, a loss of sensation in her right leg followed by complete loss of motor function. So she didn't really have any pain, she just couldn't feel anything, but no loss of bowel or bladder function and her left leg was fine. Um, she did not have a pulse on that side and she had gotten a CTA at the outside hospital which they fortunately taped to her chest. Um, and so this, this is the entire CTA that we got. Um, So really compressed true lumen. We've got dissection extending into the SMA, and then a thrombosis. Um, and there's still a little bit getting through. You can see she's got it uh, reconstituting lower down, but it clearly wasn't enough perfusion pressure. Um, so what do we do? Our next step with her. That's definitely an option. Um, but we had one big question here, which is, what kind of dissection is this? <laughs> um, everything started kind of midway down the chest. And so the big question is, this, this woman who's had a cold, insensate leg for four hours going on at this point, you know, do you delay with another CTA? Is it gonna be fast enough? Or do you go straight to the OR? Um, and so what we ended up going, we went straight to the OR, um, but we started just with an aortogram and we, I think, lucked out in that it was truly a type B. And so that's, that's where we started. Um, and I don't know if, is there any way for you to um, start this like halfway? <laughs> this is really long. <laughs> yeah, just right about there, okay. So here you're, this is, pulling back, um, and you can see that line right down the middle. So this is your true lumen, and this is your false lumen. You can see how dynamic and compressed it gets right here. And so this is your IVUS catheter, um, and we're pulling back all the way here. So, and so that's, that's before we started. Um, and we did a T-VAR, and we didn't have to go too far, fortunately. Um, so 
one of the one of the things that we think about is, you know, you don't want to cause any further damage. So if you can expand that true lumen and give the false lumen a chance to depressurize, that's really all you need to do. You don't have to stent all the way down in the acute phase. Um, and so you've still, you've still got filling of both lumens here, but you've got filling of all of your branch vessels. And six months later, and she regained sensation and function, and this is her CTA six months later. So you've still got a little bit of filling right here, which is fine because it's perfusing her gut, but then it's completely thrombosed and depressurized down there and she's palpable and, and doing well. And so that's kind of that very classic, very acute, you know, obviously there is a problem. She's got a cold, insensate leg. We had a great CT scan for it. Um, this case um, was a, a little bit more difficult. So this was a 69-year-old woman. She presented to our uh, emergency room about an hour after acute onset of chest pain, radiated to her back, no neurologic symptoms, had some mild abdominal pain. She had actually self dc would her antihypertensive because the amlodipine was making her ankles swell and she felt like no one would listen to her about it. Um, so she had a CTA and actually she was somebody who had a PE scan first, negative for PE, um, so then they got a CTA. So she gets two dye loads um, in quick succession. She's admitted to the ICU for blood pressure control and this is her first true CTA. So it's a type B, but you've got almost equal filling. This is one thing you can look at is how bright both lumens are. If they're pretty equal, you've got a, a pretty bad problem. So you can see how compressed, oh, sorry about that. Maybe, can you play this again? Sorry. Thanks. So she's got a tear up here. You can see this is blurry. That's a really dynamic flap. Um, and then as you come down, you can see how compressed the true lumen is here. And she actually gives off her celiac and SMA from the true. And then here, that left renal and right renal are kind of both. Um, and it extends into both iliacs here coming down. So, so this is the recon and I think it did a really nice job of showing just how compressed this true lumen is. Um, and this is all false coming all the way down. And here's your compressed true lumen here with your viscerals coming off your uh, celiac and your SMA. So she gets admitted. Her blood pressure is really hard to control. She gets started on Esmolol. We add Cardine. She's actually becoming, you know, short of breath because she's so volume overloaded. She, oh. She had a very, uh, she had an acute shortness of breath at one point, so we re-CTA'd her, make sure she doesn't retrograde. Um, and this is what her creatinine is doing over the course of 10 days. So it's creeping up, it's getting higher, and the question, did we do this to her or is this her disease process? So we got an ultrasound, and this is actually, so this is an aortoiliac duplex, you can see that uh, super renal flap right there. Here's a nice transverse image. And then we duplexed all of her viscerals. And what you see here in her right renal artery is this is a steel phenomenon. And so this is this kind of double spike right here is the flap prolapsing into the renal artery and out again. Um, and so here's a, a slightly bigger picture of it. And they weren't sure if they saw a flap extending into it, but it was obviously a pretty concerning finding. And especially when you think about the fact that all of this is essentially warm ischemia time. So we decided at this point, the best thing was gonna be to take her for a T-bar. Um, and unfortunately our, our IVIS images didn't save, but this is our aortogram to start, and so you see that really compressed true lumen down below. 
and this is afterwards. And so it's still compressed down below, but this is immediately after we've put the T-bar pieces in. And so once you give the false lumen a chance to thrombose and depressurize, you actually have pretty big improvement. So that's our intervention, and this was her creatinine 10 days later. And this is her CTA about six months out. And so we had a really nice seal proximally. And you can see we use two pieces there. And here as you go down, I mean, you remember that that was just a sliver of true lumen and now it's completely expanded. And so this was a, a pretty nice result. Her kidneys are working. Um, so this is her pre-op, so you have that like, sliver of true lumen here, down at the SMA, you've got that sliver coming off there, and these are kind of comparison cuts, so here you don't even see it. And that's her. So the conclusions from, from this kind of malperfusion stuff, so it's a very complex disease process. Unfortunately, it's not gonna be as easy as complicated, uncomplicated, acute, chronic. You know, there's a lot of, a lot that we don't know, um, but we know that malperfusion can actually take on many presentations, and you really have to have a high index of suspicion. If it's not something obvious, like they come in with a flaccid paralysis or a cold leg, you know, if they have a little bit of abdominal pain, is that because they're dissected? or because they're malperfused, um, you know, pain out of proportion to exam, it's, it's not really clear, and so you should use all of your, all of your diagnostic adjuncts, um, but if you have to intervene early, you should feel comfortable doing that. Um, so use your, use your adjuncts if you have a vascular ultrasound available to you. I think it's a really, really great way to uh, image the visceral vessels um, and may be valuable throughout the disease course. So thank you to Dr. Hayes for getting me involved and to everyone at U of C the past couple of years. So I'll take any questions. <laughs>